Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this live webinar, uh, promotional non-promotional non webinar organised and funded by AstraZeneca. Uh, today, I'm going to be taking you through lessons learned from the 2022 EQA scheme for molecular testing in lung cancer tissue samples. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping notes before we proceed. So we've automatically muted your microphone to avoid any background noise whilst I'm talking. Um, we are recording this webinar, so the intention is to turn it around in the next two weeks to make it, and we will make it available on the EMQN uh, YouTube channel for you to watch at your leisure afterwards and share with your colleagues if necessary. Um, and uh, like all the webinars we organise with AstraZeneca, we, this is an interactive forum as much as anything else. So it's about education. Um, so please do use the Q&A window to submit your questions for me. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that. We'll have a dedicated session at the end of the webinar. Um, we've got an hour scheduled, so we should have sufficient time to, to run through some of your questions and answers. OK, next slide, please. Um, so. Feedback, we always use your feedback. It's really important to us. We, it's, it helps us shape these webinars, make them and improve them for you in the future. Um, and more importantly, it provides an important resource for you uh, afterwards uh, to, to resource your training for your staff, et cetera. High quality healthcare and, uh, and training for your staff is important to us as much as it is to you. Um, so please do complete the feedback survey that you'll be sent by email shortly after the webinar should only take you a couple of minutes. Um, and that feedback will be, as I say, used to help us provide better and improve our uh, webinars in the future. Next slide, please. So I probably don't need any introduction, but I'm gonna introduce myself anyway. Uh, so my name is Simon Patton. I'm the CEO of EMQN uh, CIC. Uh, I'm a, a marine biologist by training initially uh, and a geneticist by my, through my PhD. Uh, and I've been working in the field of quality assurance for genetic testing or genomic testing for the last 25, 26 years, predominantly through my role with EMQ and CIC. I've also had other roles and hats on within the diagnostic community. So I work for a very large UK um, genetic testing laboratory based in Manchester. And then during that time, I also worked as the quality manager for the laboratory for 10 years or so. So I've got a very broad background in in uh, quality and more importantly, genomics uh, in, the, in the healthcare market. Um, and from an EMQ, EMQN perspective, the EMQN, for those who are not aware, started in 1997 as a European project grant. And after the funding finished, we, we changed the financing model for it. So it became funded by subscriptions from you, the users. And in 2021, sort of just middle of pandemic and impact of Brexit also taking us, um, our uh, hospital decided that they'd spin the business, spin it out as an independent business. Um, so we use a, uh, what's called a community interest company model, which is effectively a non-profit making company model uh, unique to the UK. Um, so we are now uh, standing on our own two feet, based still very closely and um, very close to the original uh, hospital in Manchester on the Manchester Science Park. Um, and you know, our, our roots are, are still strongly in, in in providing uh, support to our community of users. Um, and that's also vitally important with the commitment of our users, our, our volunteers who help us make our activities so successful. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. So my disclaimer, uh, so this is a non-promotional webinar organized and funded by AstraZeneca. The views are articulated are mine and not necessarily those of AstraZeneca. All the information I'm presenting is my own uh, or internal data based from EMQN, and those are my disclosures as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. OK, so I'm, my assumption is that the majority of you, the users, will already be aware of what EQA is, but uh, there's always a, a small number of users, a small number of um, uh, webinar participants who are not. So one slide, and I promise it's just one slide, on what e EQA is and why it's important from a, from a laboratory testing perspective. So um, the principles behind all EQA schemes that the participation laboratory is provided with the same sample, so we can compare your performance against everybody else, benchmark it. Um, the results of that sample are uh, always sent back to the coordinating centre for assessment, so back to EMQN. We do all the assessment and coordinate it. 
Um, but from a laboratory perspective, you are expected to treat those samples in the same way as a patient sample and, and, and test them with your routine procedures uh, and utilize the same personnel who would normally perform the tests. And then we compare your results against everybody else to determine the accuracy of your laboratory and benchmark it against any other laboratory participating. Um, there are lots of pros and cons. I won't go into the details of whether that's true in terms of reality of how labs implement EQA, but that's the background principles behind it. So if you like, we're testing the testing laboratories. We're an exam board for the laboratories doing the testing. Um, so the advantages of doing EQA is it provides you with an external measure and an external audit of the, of the quality of your service. Um, and more importantly, and I think the emphasis really should be on the latter, latter point, is that EQA is there to provide continuous education and training for you. So if you participate with EMCN, you will know and understand that our reports are very detailed, quite, quite lengthy, provide a huge amount of information, including background information, and it's there to help provide education and training for you, the users. Um, but there's a, undoubtedly a, a, a regulatory component to what we're doing. So another key aspect of what we do is to, we monitor performance, global performance, for any laboratory undertaking a particular test. And regulators in many countries do take note of what you do is in terms of a laboratory participating in EQA. And if you do make repeated mistakes and not um, and every, every laboratory can make mistakes in an isolated scenario, but if you continually make the same mistakes or make mistakes across multiple different EQAs, then you can find that the regulators can suspend the activity, the testing activity of that laboratory until they uh, address the root causes of their performance issues. So the, the emphasis really here from an EMQ perspective is more on the education and training, but we do obviously have a, a, place, a role to play within the regulatory framework as well. Next slide, please. The next slide, two slides really just to give you a feel for so how the EQA scheme is working, how we've designed it, the strategies we've used behind it. Um, so this scheme is the largest EQA scheme for lung cancer tissue testing in the world. Um, we have this year 425 laboratories. That number is capped um, by, um, by AstraZeneca and Amgen, who have uh, provided unrestricted access and support for your participation in the scheme. So it costs you nothing. Um, the 12th year we've run this EQA scheme, and that number of 425, as I alluded to, have been capped. We have always have, we're always oversubscribed to this scheme. Um, so it's, I mean, it's delight, it's great to see the participation numbers that are coming through. Um, and we may look at that number in future to see whether we can actually slightly move it up a little bit to accommodate a few more laboratories in future. But from a laboratory perspective, you are expected to turn around our samples in about eight to 10 weeks, which in a, from a clinical context is considerably longer than you, you would be expected to do this type of analysis on real patient samples. Uh, and we were expecting laboratories to do perform mutation analysis on at least EGFR, BRAF and KRAS. Uh, and to report your findings to us uh, for, our, for assessment. All your reports have been assessed by at least two expert peer assessors. So individuals who are working, who've been working in the field for a long time uh, in, in tissue testing for lung cancer. Um, and those assessors independently mark your results. Um, and we then aggregate the date, the, the marking scores together to come together with your final score. Um, so the assessment actually includes not just uh, an assessment of your the genotyping or the analytical accuracy of your test process, but also how you convey that and interpret that information and the meaning of the result, the analytical result, to the end user and the reporting process, including an assessment of the structure of the report that you also provide. Um, this year, testing for EGFR and KRAS was mandatory. We had a long debate with the assessors about the level of how far we should go with in terms of deciding the mandatory genes to test. But it's clear that the, the field has moved on massively in the last 12 years. And it's really, it's not, it's not sufficient nowadays just to be testing EGFR, or even actually to be honest in isolation KRAS as well. We really should be doing um, tests that have encompassed far more genes because there are now clinically relevant um, therapeutic options for patients um, with, with, biomark with, with variants in multiple different genes. So laboratories didn't lose marks this year in, 20, well, in 2022 if they didn't test BRAF. Um, but we are we constantly keep this under review and, and, and move, this, move the, this EQA scheme design forward every year based on the feedback from the assessors. Um, but certainly if you were doing EGFR testing, obviously, which was the first gene tested in this context of solid tumours for, for lung cancer, uh, then we do expect all laboratories to be able to taste all four 
TK domains. Um, and hopefully using a strategy that allows you to differentiate the individual variants in that in that in those domains. The okay, next slide, please. So our aim is to um, ask you to genotype samples from artificial FFPE sections uh, accurately and to identify the variants in, in, in those samples. Um, we want you to interpret the results in the context of the clinical referral we've provided. We put a lot of effort into challenging you with different scenarios every year. And we want to see you know, your, the end result of your work um, in a clear and concise format, since what you're doing is providing results back to a clinician who only has a limited amount of time to be able to take in the results and the, the take home message. Uh, we're also looking at how you, you, how you call the variants themselves. So we're looking to see compliance with internationally accepted um, variant nomenclature and standards. Uh, and we're also looking to assess whether you provide appropriate and accurate patient and sample information identifiers. So in other words, is the, is the report from the right patient? Have you referenced the patient correctly, et cetera? Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the format of this year, this year, the 2022 EQA scheme was no different from the previous year, so certainly from 2021. So again, all laboratories were expected to test 10 FFP samples. Um, the samples we used this year were manufactured by Horizon Biosource Limited um, from engineered lymphoblastoid cell lines. So there were um, no um, real tissue samples included in 2022. We, are, we have changed that for 2023. It was just a resource issue associated with, with um, the COVID pandemic that meant we had to provide purely engineered cell lines in 2022. <clears throat> and our strategy is we don't provide slides, unfortunately. We always provide scrolls for laboratories to test. Um, the testing requirements required laboratories to test samples one and two for a full clinical analysis. So that includes not just the genotyping, but also the interpretation and the reporting of the, of the variants they found. But for the remaining eight cases, we only expect a laboratory to submit a genotype, and we provided you with a pro forma with which you could fill in to, to, to facilitate that process. As per all of our EQA schemes, every sample is independently validated prior to distribution to laboratories, so we know what the known genotype is, and we can compare your results against the known genotype. Um, also, this, so this, this samples were independently validated using both droplet digital PCR and targeted NGS. In this case, using the uh, Thermo Fisher on command panel um, on, a, on an iron torrent, torrent platform. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We're heavily reliant on, on peer assessors to help deliver these EQA schemes. Without their uh, knowledge and expertise in the testing process, it's very difficult to deliver these schemes, particularly an assessment of the interpretation and reporting. Um, so we always use a, a, a well-tried and tested harmonized set of marking criteria for our assessment. We've, this is obviously something we've been doing for a long time. We've refined these, these, these criteria for this, for this types of disorders and changes. Um, and this year we had a team of 25 assessors from 13 different countries who supported the EQA scheme, for which we're uh, very grateful to them. So you can see um, the distribution of the, of the assessors across from Australia, Belgium, Canada, Croatia, Greece, India, in Italy, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Spain, Switzerland, and the UK. So thank you once again to all of those assessors for helping deliver that e this EQA scheme. Next slide, please. So it's always worth looking at just the participation data in advance. Um, and in future, we, what we might also do is break down the numbers compared year on year uh, the detailed analysis, but you can see this year, as per 2021, we, all, we limited the capacity of the scheme to, to 425 laboratories, and about 80% of the labs this year were uh, had participated at least in one previous year run of the EQA scheme, and the remaining 20% were completely new to the EQA scheme. Um, that split was slightly slightly more laboratories participating from last year than compared to 2021, but in you can see from the data that predominantly um, as the schemes become established, about 80% of the labs are new to uh, are, are established participants in the EQA. And then if you look at the breakdown of the regions of interest, so where the laboratories actually come from, you'll see uh, a small number of laboratories from, from Africa. Um, about 15% of the laboratories come from the Asia Pacific region, excluding China, and a further 22% come from China itself. Um, just over 55% of laboratories come from the EU region. Um, and then the remaining laboratories are split between North and South America and Oceania. 
And in total, we had 53 different countries represented in this scheme this year. So you can see the biggest numbers of participants by, 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 by volume, if you like, are between China, Italy and Spain. Next slide, please. So let's dig into the details of the individual cases we provided this year. Um, so remember, we, we provided 10, 10 samples for analysis, and the first cases, one and well, first two cases, one and two, were the, 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 the full clinical interpretation uh, cases themselves. So we'll go through cases one and two before we then come back to the genotyping or analytical take cases, which is cases three to 10. So case one was a referral from a female uh, born in 1956 who was a non-smoker and had presented with an enlarged left lymph node uh, after a left lower lung adenocarcinoma was re resected pre in the previous year. And that individual had also had one cycle of platinum-based chemotherapy. A biopsy of the left lymph node showed a metastatic adenocarcinoma of the, primary of the lung primary using an immunohistochemical study. So molecular testing of the biopsy for the purpose of clinical management was now requested by the treating oncologist. So a fairly standard referral effectively for this type of cancer. And we, <clears throat> our, our validated data, we expect laboratories to detect uh, an exon 20, EGFR exon 20 insertion uh, in this sample and no variant detected uh, in both KRAS and BRAF. So you can see the, 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 the EGFR result based on the, the, the main reference sequence. So again, something to highlight, we'll come across it later on, is that we've now switched to using main reference sequences rather than L, 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 LRGs. Um, so an exon 20 insertion was the expected result in EGFR. Next slide, please. So uh, the rationale for this case, well, this was a case with a new clinically actionable biomarker. So uh, drugs that target um, this variant, um, so we're looking at in the context of licensing this drug, this drug, the drugs that target this variant have been available since May 2021. Um, and these types of variants of the XN20, in exon 20 of EGFR are generally resistant to EGFR TKI therapy. So this is a new drug that allows, the, that allows this patient to be treated. Now we are totally aware of the fact that, it, that this, uh, ex, uh, these types of drugs aren't available in all regions. And obviously, um, the, the licensing is, is such that, you know, if you don't, if you're not able to test it, uh, so not able to access the drug, you wouldn't, you're unlikely to be testing it or less likely to be testing it. We take all these things into account in the assessment process, but we're here to help provide education. And we think it's really important that laboratories should be aware of new developments in this field and particularly new biomarkers. Next slide, please. So when we look at the results, uh, seven laboratories uh, had critical, critical genotyping errors. So that's about just under 2% of all the, the number of tests undertaken on this sample. Um, the majority of the errors were false positive errors, sorry, false negative errors. So we only had two false positive errors uh, and we didn't identify in the, in the process um, any systematic problems with particular assays associated with detecting this variant. So the, the number of the, a, diff, a wide variety of different assays uh, failed to pick up the variant, um, but there were no systematic trends associated with that. Next slide, please. So when we look at genotyping a bit more in a bit more detail for this sample, um, we can see that many laboratories uh, do use a test that can detect um, exon 20 insertions, but they're unable to distinguish between the different types of exon 20 insertions. Um, so uh, the strategy used by these laboratories to, is to list a string of many different variants in exon 20. Um, uh, it's a, a many different exon 20 insertion variants, should I say, or to say exon 20 insertion detected. Um, some assays do not include this specific variant within their scope, and we obviously that was that was uh, dealt with in the, inter the assessment process. But I think what's clear and what's a rec what's clearly coming from the assessment team is that laboratories really need to start to consider extending the scope of their testing by employing a method that can distinguish the individual exon 20 variants. It's not really sufficient to, to just provide a test that just uh, doesn't give a, a breakdown of which variant you actually detected. Uh, we understand the complexities around this and that obviously the, the, the funding of tests is important, how you get reimbursement for your particular tests, and also within the turnaround time of a particular workflow, um, it may be suitable to provide to use a test that's uh, less uh, able to discriminate the variants themselves 
um, at, for a lower cost and a quicker turnaround time. But we're now moving to an era where um, many more biomarkers are being used, and it's I think it's more it's it's becoming more important that laboratories are using should be using a test that's able to distinguish the individual variants found in the sample. Next sample, please. Next case, sorry, please. So looking at interpretation of this case, there were eight critical interpretation errors this year, so just over 2%. Um, so the, 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 the main uh, cause for, for, for a critical error in this case was that the patient, the laboratory stated the patient would have increased, increased likelihood of benefiting from EGFR TKI therapy, seven laboratories. And another laboratory stated the EGFR variant in the interpretation section of the report to, uh, to the correct one stated, a different one, should I say, to the one the correct one stated in the in the results section of the report. So those eight laboratories will have seen critical gene, critical interpretation errors as a consequence of that. Um, and again, it comes back to the to not only just the test strategy, but a lack of general lack of awareness of EGFR exon twenty inhibitor therapies and therapeutic options. Um, so the assessment team again strongly recommended that laboratory, regardless of whether a therapy is or not available in your region, the laboratory should check the latest guidance and report accordingly. So you don't know who you, you I mean, your, your report could go to somebody else as well as your clip referring clinician. So it's really important to have to guide any re reader to the, to the options that that patient may or may not have, um, regardless of whether the funding is in place for it or not. So the laboratories that fail to discuss the Exxon, uh, EGFR Exxon 20 insertion therapies were penalised this year. So last year we included this type of scenario pre previously, and we did let laboratories know that we, we fully expected to see some mention about um, Exxon 20 uh, EGFR in, insertion therapies as a consequence of that. Next slide, please. Um, several laboratories indicated the presence of, a, of the EGFR X insertion Exxon 20 insertion in the sample meant that the patient would may be more likely to obtain clinical benefit from an EGFR TKI. Uh, this is clearly incorrect as the majority of these types of variants are resistant to that type of therapy and hence the development of the new targeting therapies we've just been talking about. So please obviously uh, do ensure that your reporting strategy picks up on this. I think many of these types of reports were made by laboratories that use a standardized um, uh, uh, interpretive comment that's not based on the individual patient itself. Clearly, you know that can be very, very misleading for the for the for the clinician, and may also have an, a clinical impact on on the patient themselves. Uh, so, several laboratories employed a test method for EGFR that had limited scope. I.e., they only tested uh, EGFR exons nineteen and twenty one, and went on to conclude that no, there was no clinically relevant variant detected in the patient sample. Uh, and that there were no therapeutic options available for that patient. Again, this is incorrect. Um, and we would expect to see the laboratories mentioning the, the opportunity for further testing, or at least recommending further testing could be carried out. Um, so again, it comes back to the original points. The, the assessment team very strongly recommend that the laboratories use a test strategy that covers all exons that may harbor a clinically relevant EGFR variant. So as a minimum, exons 18, 19, 20, and 21. Next slide, please. So on to the next case, which was case two. And again, this is a, a lady born in 1961. And the lady was an ex-smoker, had a uh, lung adenocarcinoma resected uh, and had received platinum-based chemotherapy two years previously. Um, she was presented with a right pleural effusion and a cell block had been made from that pleural effusion um, to confirm the, the presence of a lung aden adenocarcinoma together with the use of his immunohistochemical uh, studies. So sections from that cell block have been provided by the oncologist for molecular analysis to determine treatment with a targeted therapy. So in this case, we uh, were, were expecting the laboratory to detect uh, a KRAS G12C variant and no variant present in both EGFR and BRAF. Next slide, please. So again, just like the first case, this is a, 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 a routine molecular referral, but for a new clinically actionable biomarker. Um, so this variant was included to determine how, how you, the laboratories, would interpret in the context of the FDA licensing that was released in 2021 for uh, KRAS-G12 specific inhibitor therapy. Next slide, please. 
So looking at the analytical testing, um, we detected 11 gene, uh, critical genotyping errors for this case, so slightly higher than the first case, so just over 3% of laboratories, or 3%, should I say, of the tests undertaken on this sample. Um, there was one false positive result, so the laboratory detecting the presence of a BRAF uh, codon 600 variant, and their assay was using multiple different test strategies to try and determine the genotype of that sample. I can't say for sure in exactly which one of those assays the, the error was detected. Um, and the remaining errors were, uh, remaining genotyping errors were all false negatives, so laboratory is failing to pick up the KRAS variant. And again, just like in case one, there were no, there were no, multiple different tests used in this sample. There were no clear strategies or problems with particular tests associated with it. We had a broad range. So if you go to the next slide, please, you can see that the, 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 the list of different sa sample strategies is, is fairly extensive. And so a 10, 10 different errors, of which only one of them was replicated in twice in, in the same type of test. Um, so next slide, please. So um, 12 laboratories used test methods so that uh, we're unable to discriminate the KRAS, the G12C KRAS variant from several other variants in codons 12 and 13. So in this case, uh, DDPCR, real-time PCR, for example, et cetera. Um, and again, uh, the strategy for this case was to, just like the first case, highlight a brand new biomarker, highlight the need for laboratories to actually understand that the testing strategy needs to be able to incorporate more than just the common variants you see, or should I say more than the, 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 the established variants that laboratories have been testing for and previously. So the assessment team strongly recommended that laboratories consider implementing a strategy that allows that, allows you to uniquely characterize this variant. Um, this is one particular variant in, 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 this, in this codon. There are three or four, well, at least three other, others are also a, a discriminated at, at codon, at codon 12. So but for the purposes of, of, of therapeutic adoption, you really need to be able to detect G12C. Next slide, please. Uh, interpretation, unlike case one, there was no critical interpretation errors for case one, which is fantastic to see. Gold star for all your laboratories, brilliant. Um, there were a small number of laboratories that are still unaware of the, of the KRAS G12C inhibitors um, <clears throat> that we talked about were licensed in 2021. Um, so again, the same, same re remark was made by the assessor, assessment team that, that regardless of the available therapeutic options in your local environment, laboratories really should check the latest guidelines and report that uh, and make the recommendations based on that for the end user. Uh, many laboratories participate, uh, stated that the patient had an increased likelihood of benefit from, a, from, from, this, from these, these, these drugs, um, and again, or from a named drug, should I say. Um, and this is a problem we see multiple times. We have seen it over the course of the 12 years. So laboratories using ne specific named drugs in their, in their reports. We strongly recommend that you avoid using specific drug names. Um, as these are subject to change, particularly from licensing, etc. And obviously, there may well be more than one particular therapy available that targets the same biomarker. So it's preferable to use that in your reports to refer to the drug class and not the drug name. So, for example, KRAS G12C specific inhibitor therapy, and allow the clinician to decide what treatment to give to that patient. Since treatment is usually a, a clinical decision based on lots of different factors. That you as a laboratory scientist probably have no impact, no, no, no effect on influencing, for example. So please try to, to, to restrict your use of naming to the class of uh, the, the drug class rather than the individual drugs themselves. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, that's the two uh, fully interpretive uh, cases. Uh, and as, as normal practice, we include those every year. We're trying to, we, this year we were targeting. You, your, your knowledge and understanding of the availability of new drugs. Uh, for the remaining th cases, eight cases, so cases three to eight, um, laboratories were only required to submit the genotype, so we didn't require any clinical report. We provided you with a pro forma to upload your results onto. Um, so looking at the results, uh, you can see that 50% uh, of the samples contain variants, the remaining 50% were all wild type. Um, cases three, four, eight and 10 contain clinically relevant variants. So case three contained a variant in EGFR, 
as well as a variant in BRAF, particularly a, 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 a code on 601 change in BRAF, interesting sample to use. Um, code, uh, sample four contained a, uh, a unusual, but not uh, that unusual, code on form 46 uh, KRAS variant. Um, sample eight contained a, a, a BRAF uh, a code on 600 variant. And finally, sample 10 contained two variants in, um, in EGFR, an exon 19 deletion, as well as a resistance variant, um, T790M. So again, we're just trying to challenge some of the, some of the more routinely or, or unusual samples that you, the variants that you might expect to see in this type of tumor type. Next slide, please. So all those, routine, well, all those samples are routine clinical referrals. And when we look at the error rates, um, an interesting distribution of error rates. So don't forget samples three, four, eight and 10 contained clinically actionable variants and the remaining samples were wild type. So when you look at the distribution of errors, you can see that um, sample three, there were 18 critical error, genotyping errors. So just under 5% of the samples tested were, um, were, were, were incorrect, of which two of them were uh, false positive results. So in this case, the laboratory picking up a G12C variant rather than the, the, the EGFR variant expected. Um, the remaining samples are false negatives, or false, the remaining errors, should I say, false error, false negative. Uh, sample four, <coughs> again, just done, well, for just over 4% of the samples were, were incorrectly genotyped. Again, the distribution of, of errors were based around false negative results. Um, sample eight, uh, just under 3% of the samples were incorrectly genotyped, and most of those errors were again false negative. And finally, sample 10, um, which contained the, the two EGFR uh, variants, there were a large number of errors made in this case, just under 10% of the, of the cases genotype were incorrect, of which the majority were false negative results. Uh, and then with the wild type samples, you can see there were distribution of predominantly false negative, positive results um, detected by the different laboratories. Again, no common strategy available or, or seen or noticed by us in terms of the tests actually re, re, uh, resulting in the wrong or incorrect genotype. Next slide, please. So uh, key findings from these four, these, these eight cases. So we're gonna focus predominantly on the, the samples that contain clinically actionable biomarkers. <coughs> um, case three, so eight laboratories failed to report the BRAF601 variant. Um, some indicated that it was within the scope of their assay and limitations of the test they used, whilst others failed to provide an adequate test scope. So again, this really comes, to ha comes down to how laboratories report what they do on their report, say how they do their test. Um, five laboratories failed to report the, the, the EGFR variant in this case, and a further two laboratories failed to report both the, the EGFR and the BRAF variant. Um, case four, um, so several laboratories used a test method that was limited in scope, so very similar to the scenario we saw with cases one and two, um, that was only able to detect uh, variants in, codons, uh, in KRAS codons 12 and 13. Uh, so therefore completely unable to detect other variants like 146, et cetera. And this was a 146 variant, code and 146 variant. Uh, uh, the recommendation, as, as already reiterated for, for case two, is using a test strategy that covers all, o, all, coding, all codons, which may harbor a clinically relevant KRAS variant. So that would include 12 and 13, plus 59, 61, 117, and 146. Next slide, please. Case eight, uh, approximately 50% of the laboratories didn't test the BRAF gene. So BRAF testing is recommended in lung cancer, in non-small cell lung cancer, um, because there are available BRAF MEK inhibitor therapies, uh, which can be used, um, especially if the patient has a V600E uh, variant present. Uh, again, uh, uh, we're just highlighting the NCCN guidelines. There are other guidelines as well. But the point here is that there are available therapies. So if an available therapy is, a, is, is, is available for, for, say for that patient, you should really look at using a strategy that is able to detect those clinically relevant uh, variants. So case 10, if you remember rightly, this was the sample that caused a lot of problems. So very high genotyping error rates, just under 10% of the cases tested were, were incorrect. Um, so many laboratories <clears throat> are still unable to distinguish the exact EGFR exon 19 variant. Um, so uh, we still see laboratories reporting X, uh, X19 DEL or 19 DEL, 
um, which is very misleading. Um, it, it, yeah, is it a deletion of Exxon 19 or a deletion within Exxon 19? So please spell out what you've detected. What have you found? A deletion, of, a deletion in Exxon 19 of the EGFR gene. Be specific about it. And don't just use the kit insert and packaging insert to report what they've, they've actually stated. Make it clear to the end user that you've actually detected a deletion in Exxon 19 of the EGFR gene. And um, <clears throat> two or three, well, in fact, two laboratories described uh, the EGFR T790M variant as a variant of uncertain significance uh, and, and acquired a penalty for doing so. Remember, this variant has got clear evidence for resistance um, to, to, to TKIs, EGFR TKIs, uh, and therapy is available for patients with uh, T790M variants. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So uh, looking at some of the summary data for the, for the EQA scheme, um, remember we restricted the number of participants to 425. We actually had 424 registrations. So I'm not sure why we've, we had, probably had a dropout just before the scheme went live. Uh, the number of withdrawals were 19. Uh, the number of laboratories that didn't submit results, 28. And remember every laboratory doesn't submit a result without telling us in advance. In other words, those are not categorized as a withdrawal. Um, are automatically become poor performers. So it's in your interest if you fall into this category to make sure you tell us before the results submission. Can you go back, please. A couple of slides. Keep going. That's yes, thank you. Back. Thank you. That's good. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, remember, it's in your interest um, if you were categorised as a poor performer on the basis of non-submission to make sure you tell us before the results submission deadline closes. Um, these are unnecessary poor performance for you. Um, it really doesn't take too much effort to tell us that you're, you're withdrawing from the EQA scheme. And also, more importantly, it means you don't get categorised as a poor performer on the basis of non-submission. Um, so the total number of laboratories participating this year in the EQA scheme was 377. <clears throat> when we look at the, the overall stats based on performance, um, there were 107 uh, critical genotyping errors made by 76 laboratories this year. So 20% of laboratories made an error that would mean potentially um, patient harm or harm to the patient as a consequence of the results they submitted. So um, another way of looking at it, 80% of laboratories got the right result, 20% of laboratories didn't get the right result and could have, could have caused patient harm. So significant number of errors this year. Um, made by a, a reasonable number of laboratories. So you can see within that data that some laboratories must have made at least two mistakes and possibly even three mistakes. Um, looking at the reporting performance, so that the actual, just the feedback to the last bit, remember this is based purely on just two cases, cases one and two. There are eight inter critical interpretation errors this year made by eight laboratories. So each of those laboratories made one critical interpretation error. So 2.1% 2, 2 of the participant laboratories. Next slide, please. Looking at test strategies um, employed by laboratories, remember this year was the first year that we really fought, really trying to push laboratories to using strategies that include other genes, not just EGFR. You know, we're in the 12th year of this EQA scheme. Um, lung cancer testing, tissue testing has evolved massively in the last 12 years. It's insufficient just to be testing EGFR. Um, so when you look at strategies used last year, uh, nearly 50% of laboratories only tested EGFR, uh, and then a further 50, uh, just under 50%, 47% tested all three genes, a small number of tested just EGFR and BRAF. This year, the numbers are looking much more promising. So only 6% of laboratories tested EGFR, which is fantastic to see. Well done to you all laboratories for improving your strategies. Um, about 30% of the laboratories tested the, the two mandatory genes, EGFR and KRAS only, um, and 60, nearly 64% of the laboratories tested all three genes, which is great to see. Uh, and more importantly, a real improvement that will help to benefit the patients that are being tested in real life. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So let's have a quick look at the participation data and performance data. And here you can see on these three charts, the data for every year that we provided the EQA scheme. And what you can see in the left-hand side is the participation data. So this refers to the type, kind of aggregates the data from that table two or three slides ago, when we look at the withdrawal versus non-submission versus submitted. And what you're seeing is that um, it's certainly in the last um, four, probably year, four or five years, 
about 90 percent of laboratories are submitting results for assessment uh, and that's pretty looks to be reasonably stable um and more importantly it's good to see that this year fewer laboratories didn't submit results without telling us in advance remember we talked about uh, poor performance as a consequence of that so um out of those 10 percent laboratories that didn't submit results or withdrew um um four percent with withdrawals and six percent with laboratories that didn't submit results another important thing to state here is if you're not going to submit results and tell, tell us obviously we have a waiting list for the cqa scheme but so by doing so you you could be could have potentially deprived a laboratory another laboratory of participating in the eqa so i'm coming back to it reiterate please do tell us why you're withdrawing it really makes a difference and it means you don't become a poor performer as a consequence of that Looking at the assessment scores, so we've got data here depicted for both the genotyping and the interpretation. Um, so these are the assessment scores that we use a, a, a subtractive marking scheme. So if you get four marks, you get two marks. If you get it completely wrong, you get zero. Uh, and you can see this data is aggregated across all, all the cases analyzed. So for, for genotyping, the, the genotyping scores have sort of kind of stabilized at about 1.83. So pretty good, um, but in necessary, they will all, it's never going to be two because clearly if you make a genotyping mistake or critical error, you're never going to get two marks. So um, 1.83 is a little bit lower than last year, but in line with the mean scores over the last four or five years. Um, what's good to see is the quality of interpretation is improving. And we see this in the data, this, uh, in, the, in the reports we assess. So there's been a gradual increase in performance, improvement in performance over time. And this year we had the highest score for inter mean score for interpretation, indicating that the quality of reports being assessed has definitely improved over time. Um, it, assessing reports is always more subjective because obviously laboratories can submit, um, well, have language difficulties, for example. So we are asking most laboratories to submit data in, in English. Um, so when we start to see improvements in performance, it's a, it's, it's a true sign of, of improvements of laboratory strategies and the actual importing pro reporting process itself. Um, and then looking at critical error rates, well, you can see that this year we have had a bit of an uptick in the critical error rates, predominantly caused by sample 10. Um, that's really bumped up the, the error rate. So we're sitting at just under 3% of uh, mean uh, critical error rate across all three, all, all 10 cases this year for genotyping. And again, slightly higher for interpretation, but that number is about just, a, just over 1% in terms of mean score. Um, so uh, I, I hope it's a blip this year. We'll see from, from, from 2023. Um, but overall, I see there's, there's, the evidence is that the, the error rate is stabilizing at what we see in most of our EQA schemes at somewhere between two and three percent. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the key learning points from this year's EQA scheme. Um, so if we look at materials, this year we provided um, all artificial materials. Um, and we've talked a bit about strategies we'll be using for 2023, we'll change that. Um, so all the materials perform well. Um, so we're providing good high quality materials for laboratories to test. Uh, so the number of labs reporting a test failure was very low, um, just 0.6% of all cases analysed. So we can see that 3,750 samples were analysed this year in the CQA scheme. Um, <clears throat> then when we look at the, the genotyping and nomenclature, again, the standard of genotyping is high. I've already alluded to the fact that it was slightly lower than, than 2021. Um, but nevertheless, I think the scores uh, still still indicate that overall the standard of genotyping is high. Um, laboratories um, should always include the results for all genes tested and not omit the results for genes where no variant has been interpreted, sorry, identified. So again, we were asking laboratories to test three genes of which two of those were, were, were mandatory. We would expect you to report the results of both EGFR and KRISE irrespective of whether a variant was detected or not. So we understand what's been tested properly. Um, many laboratories are still using kits with limited analytical scope, meaning that patients may miss out on effective treatments because, because some of the clinically relevant variants are not being detected. Uh, we've highlighted that in cases one and two, um, but as I said before, testing for hotspot mutations is, is in, in today's era of, of lung cancer testing is, not, is insufficient. Um, and you really will be missing out on very less common variants which are clinically actionable or re clinically relevant. So please do think carefully about your strategy. And we all can see on the data from the the, what's being tested that laboratories are changing their strategy 
please, please, please continue to work on that and improve the quality of the testing you're delivering to your patients. Next slide, please. Um, so the majority of laboratories are using standardized uh, variant nomenclature, so we recommend HGVS nomenclature, described variants. However, we still see some need for improvement. Um, so good examples are, are continuing to copy incorrect nomenclature from commercial pack inserts. So the classic one is, is EGFR G719X. <clears throat> um, it's important to include not only the protein interpretation, because in most of what you're testing, you're doing, you're just testing the DNA. Um, so include the gene name and the change at the cDNA level, as it's the DNA you assert that itself that you are testing, not the, not the protein. The protein is always a prediction in most cases anyway. Um, only use one reference sequence per gene. You don't need to use multiple reference sequences. And I alluded to the fact that we were changing our strategy based on the changes with, with reference sequences. So last year, the, the LRGs were discontinued by the, by the NCBI um, and replaced by main transcripts, um, which have themselves have problems. We understand that and we're taking that into account in our assessment process. But working with you guys to try and help you educate, help educate you to, to introduce the use of main reference sequences into your, into your reporting process. So include a, report, a reference sequence in all reports, even when no variant has been detected, because um, it forms part of the scope of your test. It tells you what you've investigated, what transcript you've actually looked at. Uh, again, this is, this, there's a tendency for laboratories, particularly when they found no, no variant, a wild type sample, not to say what reference has been used. It should just form part of your description of your test, including the references you've actually used. Next slide, please. Moving on to interpretation. So uh, I've already alluded to the fact that the standard is improving, which is fantastic to see. Um, many in laboratories include at the end of their interpretation, for example, a phrase that, that the decision should be made by the treating oncologist based on the available data and not just mutation testing. We consider this really good practice. We'd like to see more laboratories doing that because at the end of the day, you know, cancer, cancer, um, cancer testing is, is quite often a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so it's really good practice to include this statement in your reports. Um, the key areas for improvement we can see are, um, again, a small minority, and it is reducing to be fair, a small minority of laboratories is still providing insufficient details regarding the limitations of the test or the limited detection of the test they're employing. Um, and a number are also providing confusing analytical sens sensitivity with limited detection. So make sure you understand the differences between the two. Um, the clinical interpretation should be tailored to the individual referral reason. Now, this is a common problem we're seeing, and I alluded to the impact of this in, in, in one of the other cases previously, I think it was case two. The patient being, so really you should be talking about the, the patient and what's being done with the patient. Um, there's too many laboratories, including just generic interpretation, regardless of the genotype being tested or obtained. Um, so it's very often difficult in these time, in, in these cases to, 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 to comprehend the correct result. So you can easily misinterpret um, what's been recommended. And you could, in theory, and we, would, we do pick it up as critical interpretation errors, you could, in theory, result in an inappropriate treatment for the patient as a consequence of what you've been saying on the report. So it's misleading, for example, to discuss resistance to treatment as a general comment when the actual result indicates that the patient is sensitive to a therapy. So please do try to move away from using generic riders or generic statements on the impact of that, of that variant on the pa uh, a variant on, and include it, make it more specific to the patient. Next slide, please. Finally, looking at reporting. So the standard reporting is definitely improving. Uh, over the 12 years we've been doing it, we've seen a huge, massive, broad range in the quality of reports that laboratories use or, or, or feedback to the end user. Um, some are excellent, some are very, very basic. Um, we can help support you if you want to see examples. We've got lots of examples of good reports, good reporting strategies or reporting structures, et cetera. Uh, which we make available as education reports. So if you're interested in seeing other examples, um, which might contain you know, uh, specific ways of reporting a particular variant or a layout, for example, no, no one report is perfect, we have, but we have a variety of different reports available to give you a feeling for what's good and what's poor. Um, do contact the EMQN office if you're interested in, in accessing this information.
Um, pagination error permissions, it seems so simple and so straightforward, but mistakes in pagination telling the user what page you're looking at, so particularly on multi-page reports, are, are, are so easy to fix and yet so common to see. So pagination errors, they can result to the inadvertent loss of critical data from a forwarded report. So please do make sure on your report, it says page one of one, page one of two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, make it clear to the user that they've only got one page to look at, um, or they're looking at page two of a three page report. Um, on laboratories that do submit multi-page reports, it's really important that you include patient identifiers on all the, page, on all the pages to maintain the integrity of the information provided. Again, this is part, this I think is, a, is an ISO 15189 standard, um, and we expect all laboratories to make sure that continuity of patient information is carried across to every, every page of the report. <clears throat> uh, in converse to, to previous years, we noticed a few, few long reports this year, um, of which some of those were overly long. Again, I think this is a reflection of changes in testing strategies, so laboratories using um, more complex test strategies, particularly NGS based strategies, which can mean that you know you're trying to you're trying to you have a balance to strike between making sure you provide all the information necessary for the end user, uh, plus at the same time making it concise enough for them to, to to the clinical user to be able to pull out the salient points. But please do try to keep your reports as brief as possible. Our suggested length reports is one to two pages, and that should be sufficient to be able to get most of the information across to the end user. And you can always refer the end user to your detailed test strategy on a web website, et cetera, so long as you have version control of it, obviously, um, as a way of backing up the information you provide. Next slide, please. So uh, that's a, really the end of the, of the feedback from the 2022 scheme. I just wanted to highlight what's happening in the 2023 schemes. So for many of you are already aware that we've changed our strategy this year for the lung cancer tissue scheme and separated it out into two sub-schemes to deal with this discontinuity between labs using who are familiar with new biomarkers and those who are not. So we have a common biomarkers version of the scheme and then a new and emerging bio version of the uh, biomarkers of the scheme. Um, but registration for all of our schemes closed the end of February this year. So unfortunately, if you, if you want to participate, it's now too late. Strong, strong tip, make sure you register early to avoid disappointment. Um, the samples for the lung cancer tissue scheme, scheme were shipped on the 12th of June, and the results deadline is at the end of, end of August, with the final results due to be published um, sometime around the end of December, possibly early into January 2024. And likewise, we're also running a lung cancer plasma scheme, uh, same, dead report, the same deadline for registration with slightly later reporting deadlines. And myself and my colleague, uh, Sandy Deans from GenQA, will be reporting back on the 2022 lung cancer plasma scheme later on this month. So if you haven't got a, if you haven't registered for that webinar, please do so. Uh, I think it takes place last week in, in June, but obviously if you contact the EMKIN office, we'll be able to update you with the date for that. Next slide, please. So finally, it just leaves me to acknowledge the contributions of all the people that made this EQA successful. Uh, this is not me doing the work. This is my team and all the scheme organisers and assessors. So my team in Manchester, Mel and Arthur, and then the 25 scheme organisers and assessors and scientific advisory group members who contributed to the assessment process and made the scheme what it is uh, and the success that it currently is. So thank you to all of you for your, all your hard work in making this work uh, for, 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 for the, the end users, you, the laboratories that participate. Next slide, please. So if you want to know a bit more, please do visit our website or contact the EMQN office. And I think with that, uh, I'll hand over next way to doing some QA, Q and A's. I think we've got time for a few Q and A's. So if you've got any questions and answers, please do get them in the Q and A box. Um, so I'm just going to review what we've got um, so far. Uh, so we've got a, com a question here about uh, FDA approvals. Um, so your comment about refer to treatments to FDA approvals, but will not be desirable or be re referred to EMA approvals in European labs. So yes, this is a very valid point. We are totally aware that in some of our uh, documentation, we've referred predominantly to FDA approvals. But really, the point is, it's not just about FDA approvals. It's about licensing approvals in the region of interest where you're working. So it applies just the same to EMA as it does to FDA. Um, so our reports do refer to the FDA approval for the, the drugs available for cases one and two for the EGFR exon 20 insertions and the KRAS G12C. Um, but the same reason applies for, um, 
for EMA approval as well. Um, and as I said, alluded to earlier, don't forget, we also take into account the regional differences. So if you do have a problem or an issue with the interpretation that's based on uh, and not being able to provide or offer a particular drug in a region, we still want you to refer to it. Um, but obviously, we're not going to deduct marks if, you, if, if it's not available in your country, you can't do the testing for it. OK, uh, any other questions at all? It looks like we've just got one question. We'll give it a few more, a minute or so, if anybody's got any more questions. Looks like we probably haven't. So if you have, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact the EMQN office. Uh, as I said before, we will make this webinar available on our website, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And we'll let everyone know who participated, but also our membership list know. So please do feel free to share the link to that webinar when it becomes available. And hopefully it provides you guys with a, a valuable resource for further training and education for your staff members in the laboratory who are undertaking this type of testing. And finally, please do make sure that you fill in the, the feedback survey at the end. Uh, we will send it around to you very shortly um, so that you've got you know, the ability to feedback on what we're doing. Um, your feedback does make a difference to us, so please do so, and it'd be great to get great to receive it. So, with that, uh, thank. I'd like just like to thank you all for your participation. Uh, I'm really grateful for all of those who've taken the time to dial in this, this morning. Um, uh, it's always great to to have you involved in listening to what we're doing. Uh, thank you to all our scheme organisers and assessors and my EMKN team, and most importantly, also thanks to the AstraZeneca teams and um, all the other teams that, that help support um, our, the EMKN work that we're currently doing across our broad portfolio of EKA schemes. So thanks for your time and uh, have a good afternoon. Take care.